Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte Volume 2, Chapter 8 Summer drew to an end, and early autumn, it was past Michaelmas, but the harvest was late that year and a few of our fields were still uncleared. Mr. Linton and his daughter would frequently walk out among the reapers. At the carrying of the last sheaves they stayed till dusk, and the evening happening to be chill and damp, my master caught a bad cold, settling obstinately on his lungs, confined him indoors throughout the whole of the winter, nearly without intermission. Poor Cathy, frightened from her little romance, had been considerably sadder and duller since its abandonment, and her father insisted on her reading less and taking more exercise. She had his companionship no longer. I esteemed it a duty to supply its lack as much as possible with mine, an inefficient substitute, for I could only spare two or three hours from my numerous diurnal occupations to follow her footsteps, and then my society was obviously less desirable than his. On an afternoon in October, or the beginning of November, a fresh watery afternoon, when the turf and paths were rustling with moist withered leaves, and the cold blue sky was half hidden by clouds, dark grey streamers, rapidly mounting from the west and boding abundant rain. I requested my young lady to forego her ramble because I was certain of showers. She refused, and I unwillingly donned a cloak, and took my umbrella to accompany her on a stroll to the bottom of the park, a formal walk which she generally affected if low-spirited, and that she invariably was when Mr. Edgar had been worse than ordinary a thing never known from his confession but guessed both by her and me from his increased silence and the melancholy of his countenance. She went on sadly. There was no running or bounding now, though the chill wind might well have tempered her to a race, and often from the slide of my eye I could detect her raising a hand and brushing something off her cheek. I gazed round for a means of diverting her thoughts, on one side of the road rose a high, round bank, where hazels and stunted oaks, with their roots half exposed, held uncertain tenure. The soil was too loose for the latter, and strong winds had blown some nearly horizontal. In summer, Miss Catherine delighted to climb along those trunks and sit in the branches, swinging twenty feet above the ground, and I, pleased with her agility and her light, childish heart, still considered it proper to scold every time I caught her at such an elevation, but so that she knew there was no necessity for descending. From dinner to tea she would lie in her breeze-rocked cradle, doing nothing except singing old songs. My nursery lore, to herself or watching the birds, joint tenants feed and entice their young ones to fly, or nestling with closed lids, half thinking, half dreaming, happier than words can express. "'Look, miss!' I exclaimed, pointing to a nook under the roots of one twisted tree. "'Winter is not here yet. There's a little flower up yonder, the last bud from the multitude of bluebells that clouded those turf steps in July with a lilac mist. Will you clamber up and pluck it to show to papa?' Cathy stared a long time at the lonely blossom trembling in its earthly shelter, and replied at length, "'No, I'll not touch it.' "'But it looks melancholy. Does it not, Ellen?' "'Yes,' I observed. "'About as starved and sackless as you. Your cheeks are bloodless. "'Let us take hold of hands and run. You're so low I dare say I shall keep up with you.' "'No,' she repeated and continued sauntering on, "'pausing at intervals to muse over a bit of moss, or a tuft of blanched grass, "'or a fungus, spreading its bright orange among the heaps of brown foliage.' and ever and anon her hand was lifted to her averted face. "'Catherine, why are you crying, love?' I asked, approaching and putting my arm over her shoulder. "'You mustn't cry, because papa has a cold. Be thankful it is nothing worse.' She now put no further restraint on her tears. Her breath was stifled by sobs. "'Oh, it will be something worse,' she said. And what shall I do when Papa and you leave me, and I am by myself? I can't forget your words, Ellen. They are always in my ear. How life will be changed. How dreary the world will be when Papa and you are dead. 
None can tell whether you won't die before us, I replied. It's wrong to anticipate evil. We'll hope there are years and years to come before any of us go. Master is young, and I am strong, and hardly forty-five. My mother lived till eighty, a canty dame to the last. And to suppose Mr. Linton were spared till he saw sixty, that would be more years than you have counted, miss. And would it not be foolish to mourn a calamity above twenty years beforehand? But Aunt Isabella was younger than Papa, she remarked, gazing up with timid hope to seek further consolation. Aunt Isabella had not you and me to nurse her, I replied. She wasn't as happy as Master. She hadn't as much to live for. All you need do is to wait well on your father and cheer him by letting him see you cheerful, and avoid giving him anxiety on any subject. Mind that, Kathy. I'll not disguise, but you might kill him if you were wild and reckless and cherished a foolish, fanciful affection for the son of a person who would be glad to have him in his grave, and allowed him to discover that you fretted over the separation he has judged it expedient to make. I fret about nothing on earth except Papa's illness, answered my companion. I care for nothing in comparison with Papa, and I'll never, never, oh, never, while I have my senses do an act or say a word to vex him. I love him better than myself, Ellen, and I know it by this. I pray every night that I may live after him, because I would rather be miserable than that he should be. That proves I love him better than myself. "'Good words,' I replied, "'but deeds must prove it also. "'And after he is well, "'remember you don't forget resolutions "'formed in the hour of fear. "'As we talked, we neared a door "'that opened on the road, "'and my young lady, "'lightening into sunshine again, "'climbed up and seated herself "'on the top of the wall, "'reaching over to gather some hips "'that bloomed scarlet "'on the summit branches "'of the wild rose trees, "'shadowing the highway side. "'The lower fruit had disappeared.' but only birds could touch the upper, except from Catherine's present station. In stretching to pull them, her hat fell off, and as the door was locked, she proposed scrambling down to recover it. I bid her be cautious lest she got a fall, and she nimbly disappeared. But the return was no such easy matter. The stones were smooth and neatly cemented, and the rose-bushes and blackberry stragglers could yield no assistance in reascending. I, like a fool, didn't recollect that till I heard her laughing and exclaiming, "'Ellen, you'll have to fetch the key or else I must run around to the porter's lodge. I can't scale the ramparts on this side.' "'Stay where you are,' I answered. "'I have my bundle of keys in my pocket. Perhaps I may manage to open it. If not, I'll go.' Catherine amused herself with dancing to and fro before the door, while I tried all the large keys in succession." I had applied the last, and found that none would do, so, repeating my desire that she would remain there, I was about to hurry home as fast as I could, when an approaching sound arrested me. It was the trot of a horse. Kathy's dance stopped, and in a minute the horse stopped also. "'Who is that?' I whispered. "'Ellen, I wish you could open the door,' whispered back my companion anxiously. "'Ho, oh, Miss Linton!' cried a deep voice, the riders. I'm glad to meet you. Don't be in haste to enter, for I have an explanation to ask and obtain. I shan't speak to you, Mr. Heathcliff, answered Catherine. Papa says you are a wicked man, and you hate both him and me, and Ellen says the same. That is nothing to the purpose, said Heathcliff. He it was. I don't hate my son, I suppose, and it is concerning him that I demand your attention. Yes, you have cause to blush. Two or three months since, were you not in the habit of writing to Linton, making love in play, eh? You deserved, both of you, flogging for that. You especially the elder, and less sensitive, as it turns out. I've got your letters, and if you give me any pertness, I'll send them to your father." I presume you grew weary of the amusement and dropped it, didn't you? Well, you dropped Linton with it, into a slough of despond. He was in earnest, in love, really. As true as I live, he's dying for you, breaking his heart at your fickleness, not figuratively, but actually. Though Hareton has made him a standing jest for six weeks, and I have used more serious measures, and attempted to frighten him out of his idiocy, 
He gets worse daily, and he'll be under the sod before summer unless you restore him. How can you lie so glaringly to the poor child? I called from the inside. Pray, ride on. How can you deliberately get up such paltry falsehoods? Miss Cathy, I'll knock the lock off with a stone. You won't believe that vile nonsense. You can feel in yourself it is impossible that a person should die for love of a stranger. I was not aware there were eavesdroppers, muttered the detected villain. Worthy Mrs. Dean, I like you, but I don't like your double dealing, he added aloud. How could you lie so glaringly as to affirm I hated the poor child, and invent bugbear stories to terrify her from my doorstones? Catherine Linton, the very name warms me. My bonny lass, I shall be from home all this week. Go and see if I have not spoken truth. Do, there's a darling. Just imagine your father in my place and Linton in yours. Then think how you would value your careless lover if he refused to stir a step to comfort you when your father himself entreated him. And don't, from pure stupidity, fall into the same error. I swear on my salvation he is going to his grave, and none but you can save him. The lock gave way, and I issued out. I swear Linton is dying, repeated Heathcliff, looking hard at me, and grief and disappointment are hastening his death. Nellie, if you won't let her go, you can walk over yourself, but I shall not return till this time next week, and I think your master himself would scarcely object to her visiting her cousin. Come in, said I, taking Cathy by the arm and half forcing her to re-enter, for she lingered, viewing with troubled eyes the features of the speaker, too stern to express his inward deceit. He pushed his horse close, and bending down, observed, Miss Catherine, I'll owe to you that I have little patience with Linton, and Hareton and Joseph have less. I'll own that he's with a harsh set. He pines for kindness as well as love, and a kind word from you would be his best medicine. Don't mind Mrs. Dean's cruel cautions, but be generous, and contrive to see him. He dreams of you day and night, and cannot be persuaded that you don't hate him, since you neither write nor call. I closed the door and rolled a stone to assist the loosened lock in holding it, and spreading my umbrella I drew my charge underneath, for the rain began to drive through the moaning branches of the trees, and warned us to avoid delay. Our hurry prevented any comment on the encounter with Heathcliff, as we stretched towards home. But I divined instinctively that Catherine's heart was clouded now in double darkness. Her features were so sad, they did not seem hers. She evidently regarded what she had heard as every syllable true. The master had retired to rest before we came in. Cathy stole to his room to inquire how he was. He had fallen asleep. She returned and asked me to sit with her in the library. We took our tea together, and afterwards she lay down on the rug, and told me not to talk, for she was weary. I got a book and pretended to read. As soon as she supposed me absorbed in my occupation, she recommenced her silent weeping. It appeared at present her favorite diversion. I suffered her to enjoy it a while. Then I expostulated, deriding and ridiculing all Mr. Heathcliff's assertions about his son, as if I were certain she would coincide. Alas! I hadn't skill to counteract the effect his account had produced. It was just what he intended. "'You may be right, Ellen,' she answered. "'But I shall never feel at ease till I know. And I must tell Linton it is not my fault that I don't write, and convince him that I shall not change.' What use were anger and protestations against her silly credulity? We parted that night hostile but next day beheld me on the road to Wuthering Heights, by the side of my willful young mistress's pony. I couldn't bear to witness her sorrow, to see her pale, dejected countenance and heavy eyes, and I yielded in the faint hope that Linton himself might prove by his reception of us how little of the tale was founded on fact.'